It is now time for question period. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, well, thanks very much, Speaker. My first question this morning is uh, to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier told reporters, and I quote, I won't hesitate to lock things down. Unfortunately, it seems uh, obvious to everyone, perhaps except for the Premier, that he will hesitate to put recommended public health measures in place, even when lives are at stake. If the Premier meant what he said yesterday, perhaps then he could tell us today exactly what the threshold will be for this lockdown. Premier to reply. Well, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for, for the question, Mr. Speaker. You know, all throughout this pandemic, what we do as a team and as a, as a province, we listen to our professional health experts. And that's what we're going to continue to do, is listen to the health experts, listen to Dr. Williams and the, and the health team. And when, when we see the numbers going up as we did, we acted immediately, Mr. Speaker. When we saw numbers potentially hitting 6,500 uh, cases a day, again, we acted immediately. We lowered the threshold. And uh, I know the health uh, experts around the province thanked us for doing that, along with many local mayors right across the region. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, in fact, on this side of the House, we are siding with doctors and frontline health experts calling for a circuit breaker to halt the pandemic spread and support for small businesses being devastated by the second wave of the pandemic. Sadly, the Premier has decided to gamble with people's lives, even when his own health experts begged him not to. At what point will the Premier admit that crushing the virus is, in fact, the best way to protect small businesses and jobs and offer the financial support that businesses need to survive? instead of leaving them on their own. Premier. Well, first of all, you can't have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. You can't, you can't vote against our, our budgets that are supporting uh, small businesses to the tunes of billions and billions of dollars and then come out and say, what are we doing for small businesses? There's never been more pro-small business government ever in the history of this province and this government that we have right, right here. Mr. Speaker, throughout the budget that our great finance minister put together, uh, we put a tax reduction that will reduce all BET rates by 0.88 per cent. That equals thousands and thousands of dollars for these small businesses. It will benefit, matter of fact, over 200,000 businesses and properties, or 94 per cent of all business properties in Ontario. This represents uh, a reduction of 30 per cent for businesses subject to the highest rates, Mr. Speaker. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I have news for the Premier. A business education tax reduction is not going to matter if you can't pay your bills and you're out of business boarding up your front windows and doors. The Premier needs to realize, however, Speaker, that there are lives at stake here. It isn't uh, a time for empty promises and make-believe claims about flattening the curve. Yesterday, the Chief Medical Officer of Health for this province actually said Ontario could be in green zone by, by Christmas. Yet the government's current path actually leaves us racing in exactly the opposite direction. When will the Premier make crushing the virus the priority, put health measures in place that will actually slow the spread, and offer direct, immediate support to businesses to help them survive, which is what they've been asking for and still don't have? The Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, not, not only are we lowering the BET, we're also uh, uh, looking at the e EHT, the payroll exemption of about $490,000 to a, a million, dollars, which is absolutely huge. This meant 90% of Ontario private sector employers are exempt from paying the EHT. That's, again, money being put in the pockets of, of small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We also uh, have 14,500 monthly rent that they could save over a certain period of time, and that's roughly about 90% of rent relief. Mr. Speaker, we have put in billions and billions of dollars, no matter if it's 65% of the payroll, if it's 90% with cooperation with the federal government, 90% of rent subsidy. We're there to help the small businesses, and I just wish the Leader of the Opposition would vote for some of these bills that support small businesses, then always vote against small businesses and the hardworking people of Ontario. Thank you. 
The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, but I think everybody who understands what the EHT is knows that small businesses are not going to benefit because it's about uh, businesses with big payrolls, not small businesses. So uh, we know what the threshold was, we know what the new threshold is, and it's really clear that the Premier is uh, uh, you know, trying to make something out of nothing. But nonetheless, throughout the pandemic, the Premier has repeatedly insisted, you know what I know. But it's become even more clear over the last week that that is just not the case. It has not been the case, and it's become more clear. Yesterday's Toronto's Board of Health was informed that every member of the provincial table providing public health advice to senior government officials has been made to, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So if the Premier wants us all to know what he knows, why is he muzzling people that are advising the government? Premier. Mr. Speaker, going back to businesses from uh, the beginning of this, and unfortunately, through COVID, uh, there was 1.1 million jobs that disappeared because of COVID. From June to October, Ontario gained 868,000 more jobs back, 144,000 more manufacturing jobs we've regained from June to October. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, we have more manufacturing jobs now than we did pre-pandemic. So we're going to continue supporting uh, the small businesses. Thank you. The supplementary. Well, Speaker, Her Majesty's loyal opposition is going to keep asking the Premier to be transparent about the decisions he's making on COVID-19. <laughs> Muzzling health experts would be concerning at any time, Speaker, but it's especially concerning in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, and it is outright dangerous when you have a Premier Order. who has already proven that he will claim he has the support of health experts even when Order. they disagree with him. Will the government Order. stop muzzling these Order. experts, make all, recommendations, make all recommendations from the COVID-19 tables public today? I apologize. Stop the clock. Minister of Education, come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources, Forestry, come to order. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition can resume. Thank you, Speaker. Will the government stop muzzling these experts, make all recommendations from the COVID-19 tables public today, and tear up those non-disclosure agreements? Premier. Well, oh, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I feel very, very insulting towards our great medical team that's been working here day in and, and day out. But uh, that, be, that being uh, said, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, there's no government, there's no elected official that has been out there every single day like we have. Our team's been out there at 1 o'clock. You want to know what's going on, Mr. Speaker, and being transparent? It's 1 o'clock that uh, we go out there every single day. But what, what I don't Order. accept, what I don't accept, someone criticizing me, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Liberals, they've been hiding out like Bonnie and Clyde for the last seven months. That's what bothers me. The final supplementary. Here, you know what? That kind of nonsense from the Premier of Ontario in the Order. midst of the global plan pandemic is nothing less than shameful and Order. irresponsible. He has to Order. answer questions of the official opposition, whether he likes it or he doesn't. And it became tragically clear last week that the Premier will claim that he has the support of medical experts, even when those experts disagree with him. During a pandemic, when people's lives are at stake, the people of Ontario have a right to know when the Premier is following the best medical advice and when he's rolling the dice with their health and with their well-being. How can anyone believe the Premier is following advice of experts when he's actually, literally, muzzling them, preventing them from sharing the advice with the public? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. Thank you. In fact, our government has been completely transparent with the public since this pandemic began. With the briefings that we Order. have every day at 1 o'clock where the Premier comes out and answers questions from the media on a whole variety of topics, we also have Dr. Williams coming out two Order. times a week to independently answer questions. All of that is completely independent. People can ask whatever questions Order. they wish to ask. We also have our modelling experts come out. But as to the suggestion 
suggestion that every single member of the pandemic table should be coming out with their views of things one bit at, at a time. That's not the way this thing works. What happens is we receive the recommendations through Dr. Williams. That is something that Cabinet then discusses and makes final decisions upon. That is the way any private sector organization or not-for-profit operates. You don't have Response. all the directors speaking. You have one representative speaking, and that representative is Dr. Williams, and we rely on his advice every single time. Thank you. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. As breakouts in long-term care continue to grow faster and larger by the day, the minister continues to pretend that everything is A-OK. -okay. Their stats show they've got everything under control. But while this government downplays how many seniors are getting sick or dying, nearly 250 more residents have already lost their lives in this new wave of outbreaks. Speaker, the minister and the premier want, want a pat on the back for saying things are going better than the first wave, when over 1,800 seniors lost their lives in long-term care homes. But the cold statistics can't hide the fact that families are losing their loved ones. Will the premier and the minister, the people who have lost their lives, are more than just statistics? Their families are devastated. Why won't this government act now? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government has been absolutely clear that the top priority is the safety and well-being of residents and staff and loved ones in long-term care. There is no doubt about that, and we have put every measure behind that, starting with the urgent and decisive action that we took uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, $243 million to help stabilize the sector. That went out. And recently, we announced another uh, almost over half a billion dollars, $540 million, including staffing supports, including dollars for operational aspects to improve infection prevention and control. I mean, the list goes on in terms of the dollars that we have resourced our long-term care sector to support them in their time of need. $40 million to support homes that have been impacted by the changes in the occupancy that we've had to address because the ward rooms and the 1972 Response. built homes were, were so badly neglected by the previous government and supported by the, the NDP and, and the PPE, getting all of these measures to our long-term care homes. We have taken decisive action for the benefit of residents. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, I'm, I'm asking the Premier, the government's handling of the first wave was so bad, families of those who died at Orchard Villa, one of the worst hit homes in the first wave, are now concerned that not, not, not only are homes covering up the number of people who died from COVID, they're also concerned about the deaths that the homes say were from COVID. But they believe that they're really from starvation, dehydration, and neglect. These are what the families are saying. That's what they want to know. They plan to take Orchard Villa to court in order to get answers, but the government has now changed the law, making it nearly impossible to take for-profit homes to court. So why is the Premier and the Minister, minister still protecting their friends running private for-profit long-term care homes? When, they are going, when are they going to do the right thing and just take over all these homes and ensure that this gets sorted out and this never happens again? Thank you. The parliamentary assistant, a member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Let me be absolutely clear. Individuals and organizations that ignore public health guidance and act with gross negligence or intentional misconduct will not be protected by this legislation. The narrow targeted civil liability protection in this legislation has only to do with the inadvertent transmission of COVID-19 and nothing else. This legislation does not protect any other type of negligence that we heard from the opposition in this House or at committee, like if a resident is not given proper medication or if a long-term care provider fails to provide the necessities of life or if a long-term care operator communicates inadequately with families. Ontarians will continue to be able to file claims and seek justice in the court for all of these matters. Thank you. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, as we work through the second wave of COVID-19, now more than ever, 
we have to make sure our healthcare heroes have the access to critical PPE they need to keep themselves and others safe. Early in the pandemic, our government mobilized our manufacturing sources to make the masks, gloves, face shields, hand sanitizer, and other supplies we need. And this was all able to happen in just a matter of months, not years. The response we've received has been incredible and inspiring. Ontario businesses moved fast. They innovated, they adopted, and now it's time for the government to do the same. We need to be smarter about getting those critical supplies into the hands of the frontline health care heroes. Premier, you push the government to move at the speed of the private sector, and we need to make sure we're spending tax dollars wisely. Question. When families are shopping, you go to a place, let's say, at Costco to buy groceries in bulk so you can save money. So, Premier, can you please elaborate further on how our government is ensuring that we are protecting taxpayer money? Thank you very much. Thank you. And the Premier, to reply. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank the member from Chatham, Kent Leamington, for doing a great job. And again, people love him out there. When I go out there, it's absolutely fantastic. I want to demonstrate to everyone the current situation in Ontario. I used uh, Canadian Tire, Mr. Speaker, as a good example. They have 50,000 SKUs, 50,000 different products. They have 65 procurement officers, purchasing agents. Compared to Ontario here, that has 7,000 purchasing agents. The system's broken, very simply. And through the great work, through the great work of our Minister of Economic Development, he has created a separate organization called Supply Ontario. Supply Ontario is going to centralize procurement, standardize procurement, rather than going out and buying uh, pens and papers from 10 different locations through distributors, jacking up the price. We're going to go directly Response. to the source and we're going to be buying the pens and papers and every other supply that they need in a central procurement system for the first government in the history of this country that's going to do that municipally, federally, or. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. Premier, that is absolutely great news to hear that. You know, this new initiative will ensure that it is easier for businesses of all sizes to work with the government of Ontario. From the mom and pop shops to larger companies, our government wants to purchase and promote more Ontario made products. Premier, thanks to your leadership, Ontario is once again a manufacturing leader in the country and in North America. Our industries and local manufacturers have proven time and time again during this pandemic they can make anything happen. Ontario-made products are second to none in quality and excellence. So with these investments in today's announcement, we are making sure that Ontario will never, ever be left at the mercy of other countries and leaders when it comes to critical supplies we need. So, Speaker, can the Premier please share with my constituents and all Ontarians Question. about our government's efforts to ensure that manufacturing jobs are coming back to Ontario, especially as it relates to PPE. Okay. And the Premier to reply. Thank, thank the member there. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm so excited to announce that we signed a contract with a company called PrimeMed. PrimeMed is going to make 50 million surgical masks, which is amazing. And it's amazing for the people of Cambridge. Congratulations, Cambridge, for attracting such a great, great company to see them expand. Not, not only PrimeMed, but as, as you remember, Mr. Speaker, we signed a great deal with 3M over in Brockville, again, to produce millions and millions of N95 respirators, which is great, great news. We also want to thank Linamar and O2 Medical Technologies for in investing in the ventilators. Now we don't have to rely on anyone, Mr. Speaker. We're under no one's thumb. We can manufacture anything here in Ontario. We're doing that. We're going to be self-sufficient. Not only are we going to supply Ontario, we're going to supply the rest of the country when they need Response. PPE. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Are struggling with the tidal wave of COVID patients, and cases continue to spike every single day. The strain on our system, caused by the government chronic underfunding and slow adoption of public health recommendations, will have lifelong impact on children awaiting pediatric surgery. At sick kids, two thirds of the children waiting for surgery are now outside of the developmental window for when their surgery should have been performed. The government refused to listen to advice, and now COVID cases are surging in our hospital. And 
4,750 children are languishing on surgical wait lists. Why did the government refuse to listen to the best medical advice from our hospitals? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. This is a really important topic, but we have been listening to the experts and, in fact, continuing with the surgeries and procedures that were postponed during Wave 1 is part of our uh, fall preparedness plan. We want to make sure that even as we're dealing with increases in cases of COVID-19 and dealing with the flu season, that we can continue with those surgeries and procedures. And it is particularly concerning with respect to children. I have been involved in several uh, conversations conversations with the children's hospitals and with parents of some of those children who are very concerned that these procedures need to go on so that their children can continue to develop, continue with their normal development, and to be able to, in some cases, be able to walk with some of the supports that they're receiving. So this is something that is particularly important to us and one of the key parts of our fall Response. preparedness plan that we need to keep moving so that these children can get the support that they need. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The disturbing pattern of increased cases has only made the situation in our hospital more desperate. It should have never come to this. By adopting recommendations from our hospital early and making proactive investment, this exponential spread could have all been avoided, and these children could have gotten the surgery that they need. As Dr. Kelly said, children with scoliosis, cleft palate, hip dysplasia, and limb deficiencies are losing developmental ground they will not be able to make up. Make no mistake, Speaker, once the window is gone, it never comes back. But the government has prioritized businesses over the health of sick Ontario children. Why do doctors, public health experts, and our hospital have to beg for help from this government? Minister of Health. Well, I would say to the member opposite through you, Mr. Speaker, that absolutely to the contrary, the health and well-being of all Ontarians, particularly our children, is our top priority, full stop. We want to make sure that everybody gets the help that they need, and we know through discussions with uh, Hospital for Sick Children, CHEO, and others that there are many procedures for children that need to be advanced. That is why we have created additional capacity in our hospitals. We've added more than 3,000 new hospital beds since the beginning of this pandemic to be able to handle the additional capacity, and that, of course, includes in our children's hospitals. Both CHEO, uh, Hospital for Sick Children, McMaster, all the hospitals that are providing support to children are getting the resources and the help that they need because health is our number one priority and we need to make Response. sure that all of these children get the support that they need right now because it's key for their development. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After Hurricane Hazel claimed 81 lives, destroyed nearly 2,000 homes, and cost us $1.3 billion in 1954 dollars, Ontario strengthened the mandate for conservation authorities to protect us from flooding. Their work has been a huge success. A resident in the Grand River watershed paid just $2.81 per year to protect their lives and property from flood damage. It's a bargain, especially when you consider that the average cost of cleaning up a basement flood is $43,000. So, Speaker, one of the tragic lessons we've learned from COVID is that failing to listen to scientists can have strategic Question. consequences. So I ask, why is the Premier risking people's lives and billions of dollars in property damage by gutting the nonpartisan scientific-based expertise, conservation authority. Thank you. Thank you very much. The government house leader will reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I completely disagree with the member opposite. In fact, uh, the, the proposed legislation does uh, just the opposite. It refocuses uh, conservation authorities on their, on their core mandate, as the, as the member mentioned, uh, opposite, Mr. Speaker, on flood mitigation. That's what is uh, very, very important. It changes uh, 
uh, uh, the uh, composition of the boards of uh, conservation authorities to ensure that elected officials are part of those uh, boards. And, Mr. Speaker, it goes a little bit further than that. It ensures that agriculture, that there's representatives of the agricultural community on that, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the Honourable General. The uh, conservation authorities do uh, uh, have a, an important role to play. Uh, and that role is flood mitigation, and this legislation will uh, redouble their efforts on that, Mr. Speaker, while making it uh, more accountable to the people. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to that answer, I would suggest that that government House leader actually read the legislation, yeah. because what it does is it takes the power of conservation authorities to make science evidence-based decisions and puts it in the hands of the minister to make political-based decisions that can put development in the wrong place. Here's the bottom line, Speaker, and this is something I really believe the government needs to understand. When you allow development to happen in the wrong places, it can have catastrophic consequences. When you pave over wetlands and green space, there is no place for flood water to go. It can only go into our streets. It can only go to places that damage our infrastructure. It floods people's basements. So the premier, Question. Speaker, the premier says, call me if you have a problem. So if your basement is flooded, can people call the premier and ask for the $43,000 to clean up the mess this decision will make? The government house leader to reply. I guess uh, one would wonder, Mr. Speaker, if the conservation authorities were doing such a good job, why there are flooded basements at all across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The member, uh, what the member talks about is completely wrong. What we're doing is strengthening conservation authorities to do exactly what he says, to bring it Order. back to its core mandate, Mr. Speaker. Now, I know that Leader the members the opposition of the come to are opposed to accountability, and that's why they are against the changes that we're proposing on the conservation authorities, by making sure that elected officials are ordered. I know that they're not in favour of, uh, of, uh, of enhancing the, the roles of agricultural communities when it comes to conservation. We believe just the opposite. That's why this legislation does that, Mr. Speaker. But I agree with the Honourable Gentleman. For far too long, uh, our conservation authorities have strayed from their mandate. That's why we have flooding in basements. That's why the people of Mississauga have had to endure so many challenges. This legislation Opposition come to order. the original mandate, Mr. Speaker, while making it more responsible to elected officials. Please. Could you please stop the clock for a second? We've got about halfway to go. I think the people of Ontario would expect a certain standard of professionalism and decorum in the House today. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of French Francophone Affairs. The pandemic hit hardly uh, the French services uh, businesses. What would the minister do about it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for his question. From the beginning of this pandemic, I have established a, a committee uh, about French recovery to respond to the needs of the French community. We have acted on the first, pro the first recommendation of the committee. We have invested a lot of money to help respond to the needs of this uh, community. I received the support of the advisor on this, and he said this measure of the government respond to the concerns that were expressed by the minister. We would definitely benefit from those two recommendations and it will help the French community in Ontario. In our budget, we announced an investment of $2 million. Thank you. Thank you to the Minister for her answer. I'd like to thank her for all her support for the Francophone community. Can she explain to members how she is directly working with the Franco-Ontarian community to meet their needs? The Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Within the 2020 budget, 
we have created a new working group uniting the minister, the Ministry of Francophone Affairs and the FAO. This will allow us to optimize assistance to these organizations through various government programs which already exist. This new a working group was described by Carolyn by Carol Jolin as a significant step. The ministry has listened to us and we hope to continue our work within the working group. Mr. Speaker, we have also implemented several recommendations of a working group in order to meet the needs and aspirations of Francophones, specifically an investment of six hundred and eighty million dollars to improve internet services, as well as fifty nine point five million dollars in a microcredit strategy for the skilled trades and for emergency funding of $25 million in arts and culture. The next question, member for Kitchener Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are outraged that the Premier's longtime political supporter, Charles McVitie, is getting a new university from this government. It's a strange coincidence that in the PC race just over two years ago, the Premier used Canada Christian College as a voter booth for his party leadership. The Premier tweeted for his supporters to go to the college to vote for him, wow. following weeks of campaigning for him by Charles McVitie. Wow. But strangely, neither the college nor the Premier himself have claimed this on their charity returns or on their leadership campaign expenses. Wow. Ontarians deserve to know why this government, in the middle of a pandemic, has prioritized legislation to give Charles McVitie a degree-granting university. Did the Premier insert this section in the Question. bill as payback for Charles McVitie's support in his leadership race? It's to imputing motive, and I would caution the member you can't impute motive. It was raised as a question. Minister of Colleges and Universities to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the answer is simple, Mr. Speaker. There are three universities or colleges that are seeking university status in the legislation that is presently before this House, presently being debated. All of those institutions are moving forward in a process. Uh, the institution that has been referenced here is in the midst of the process, which is, as I've explained numerous times in this House and will continue to explain, is part of a process that we have put together to ensure the most transparent and accountable way of ensuring that we follow the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees that every individual has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And, Mr. Speaker, every person has the right to be equal before and under the law, and they have the benefit Once. of equal protection and equal benefits under the law without discrimination. We have a fair, transparent process, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we'll continue to do. Great. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Upholding election law is fundamental to our roles as legislators. Elections Ontario rules are clear that the Premier's renting of space at the college should have been recorded as an expense, but no one can find that kind of an expense anywhere. This legislation would give Charles McVitie an even bigger platform to spew his hatred, bigotry and intolerance, and Ontarians remain committed to ensuring that we uphold people's human rights. They are reaching out to me asking why is this prioritized in this legislation. So far, the Premier has sat silent while Charles McVitie took nearly a million dollars in loans from the college, and he has nothing to say about Charles McVitie's hateful rhetoric or intolerance. So will the Premier finally speak up. Tell Ontarians Question. whether Bill 213 is a reward for Mr. McVitie or if Bill 213 is actually supposed to be there to help small businesses. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as we indicated and will indicate time and time again, this bill is about reducing red tape. This is about something that we've done in the past and we will continue to do moving forward. We've con con we have created a system for obtaining this type of status that is clear, it is transparent, is it, ac it is accountable, it follows the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have continually spoken about this and we have continually indicated that we are creating the most fair and transparent process. We took a ministerial consent Order. process and we made it entirely 
uh, independent and reviewed by an independent body. We have legislation, which is here in this House, that is being debated openly in this House, transparently, Mr. Speaker. Why does the opposition, all members of the opposition, Response. continually ask us to interfere with independent process? It's illegal, Mr. Speaker. You can't interfere with independent process. Order. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I had a question about my questions for the Premier. I had a question here about the flu shot. But all week long, I've been, last week when I was back home in my riding, I've been thinking about one thing. There are thousands of Muslim families who live in my riding, thousands of Muslim children who go to Ontario's publicly funded schools. There are more than 600,000 Muslims in Ontario. Many of them live here in Toronto, in your riding, Premier as well, thousands of children in school. Charles McVitie, amongst the other hateful things that he said about the Muslim faith, has said that it's not a faith, that it's a hostile takeover. So what he's saying to those children and to those families is, your faith is a threat. I can't think of anything worse. So Premier, through the speaker to you, can you stand Question. in your seat today and disavow yourself of that statement that Charles McVitie made. I need you to stand up. Ontario's Muslims need you to stand up and say that. I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Please make your comments through the chair. Mr. Colleges and Universities to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the member opposite, to all the members of the opposition. It is impossible to interfere with an independent process. So imagine for a moment, I know they have no respect for the Charter. Opposition come to order. They demonstrate that over and over and over again. We on this side of the House, we believe in the values of the Charter. We believe in the values of fundamental justice. We believe in process, Mr. Speaker. The official opposition will come to order and allow the minister to respond. Mr. of Colleges and Universities. Member from Hamilton Centre, I believe, uh, uh, indicated there is a process, there is a licensing process. And when any individual applies for a license or a designation of this nature, they have the right to make that application. The apply application, Minister, uh, under ministerial consent, goes directly to the independent reviewing body, Mr. Speaker. We have no influence, we have no part to play in it. That application Bonds. goes directly to that body. What would the opposition have me do? Hack the computer systems, Mr. Speaker? I'm not sure what they think we can do. There is no basis to interfere with independent Order. Supplementary question. That was disappointing. Uh, so I'll try to put it another way. In this building, in this room, there are people of the Muslim faith work all the way through government in hospitals, in long-term care homes, all across this province. Charles McVitie has said their faith is a threat. He's getting a special deal. There's no question about that. We know that. It's evident. Members are uncomfortable all over this house. I can see it in their faces. So this can't continue. Leadership means sometimes you stand up and you say, we're going this way, and then everybody else has to follow. So what we need is for the Premier to stand up today and say, I am instructing my House Leader to remove Schedule 2 from Question. Bill 213 and put an end to this debacle. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect to the, the Liberal member, he can play politics and bring in the Muslim community, Mr. Order. Speaker. What he hasn't done, that I have done, our family has done, we brought a young Muslim boy into our family, Order. have lived with us, has, have lived with us for 10 years. Judge the Premier, I have to interrupt, I have to interrupt, clock's ticking. I'm asking the official opposition to come to order, the clock's ticking. I, Premier has the floor to respond. I've almost seen my Muslim brother that I shared a room with, I shared my clothes with, I shared my food with for 10 years. That's what you don't understand. You're Order. playing politics, Mr. Speaker. I don't play politics. I support the Muslim community unequivocally 1,000%. No, no arguments. Thank you. Stop the clock.
Member for Ottawa Centre will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Can't withdraw, Speaker. This man is supporting a bigot. I will give the member for Ottawa Centre one more opportunity to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Withdraw, Speaker. Order. Government House Leader will come to order. Member for Ottawa Centre withdrew the comment. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Burlington. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, in response to COVID-19, Ontario's inventory of PPE and other critical supplies is strong, but it did not get that way overnight. At the start of the pandemic, we discovered the existing fragmented supply chain system put us in a precarious position. We didn't have guaranteed access to the products we needed, but our government quickly adapted, and in a cross-government effort, Ministry of Government and Consumer Services worked with Solgen to get masks to firefighters with Ontario Minister of Agriculture for Rural Affairs to supply the food industry, with Minister of Colleges and Universities to get med students N95s, and with Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services to meet the needs of women's shelters. The list goes on and on. On Monday, MGCS announced the next step in our coordinated effort to shore up our supply chain and ensure we are Question. never left with low qualities again. Can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services explain how our new supply chain agency, Supply Ontario, will ensure that we have stable access to critical supplies? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member Burlington for this very important question, because I want to recognize the efforts of our ministries that have worked so well together to ensure that we modernized a fragmented system that had over thousands of entities purchasing, because now, through our leadership, our government, Ontario, is going to buy as one. In short, Supply Ontario will lead by example when it comes to supply management, and we will manage inventory to ensure that we have the supply that meets our demands from sector to sector, ultimately ensuring that we have the resources to keep Ontarians safe and secure. It will leverage also the experience that we have of the businesses who stepped up during the pandemic and answered the Premier's Bonds. call. And, you know, we also had hundreds of consultations whereby people wanted to be involved in this modernized approach to supply management. Supply Ontario's objective is simple. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you so much, Speaker. This is very welcoming news. Speaker, by enabling our entire public sector to buy as one, it is easy to see that Supply Ontario will deliver better value to taxpayers. When people go shopping, they often buy in bulk to save money. They also often buy local. Looking to our education system, for example, it only makes sense to leverage the collective buying powers of school boards when building up needed PPE, PPE inventory and to give opportunities to Ontario suppliers. Can the minister explain how we are going to take advantage of this opportunity and drive innovation and economic development in Ontario? Minister thank you, Speaker. And thank you so much to the member for Burlington for your interest in this important initiative. We all should be celebrating the fact that Supply Ontario will deliver for the first time the best value for taxpayers by sourcing high-quality goods at scale. And I can tell you from day one, we are very much committed to taking a regional approach and connecting businesses of all sizes and inspiring entrepreneurs, including small, medium, rural businesses of all sorts, to get involved and to have an opportunity to supply the Ontario government 
as well as its customers. By acting as a first purchaser speaker for emerging technologies, Supply Ontario will pave pathways for innovation. We just heard the Premier moments ago speak about PrimeMed, a perfect example of a local grown in Ontario company that stood up and it's Response. going to be hiring in full, in full uh, production upwards of 250 people in Cambridge. It's important to note, Speaker, Supply Ontario and the merits of employing a proper, modern supply management process has been well received. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, according to the Toronto Star, Brampton has one of the highest positive test rates in the country at 19 per cent. We are one of Ontario's hardest hit regions, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that our health care system does not have the capacity to keep up with the demand in caseloads. The Brampton health care system has been underfunded for decades. Previous Liberal and Conservative governments have not made the investments we need to increase our health care capacity. Brampton Civic is consistently in gridlock because of the failures of this government. That means that our hospital is not able to service patients and that outpaces the demand that our hospital is seeing. Peel Region and the City of Brampton simply do not have the dedicated resources they need to prevent the crisis unfolding in our city. Speaker, the people Question. of Brampton are risking their lives to move goods across this province. What does the Premier have to say to those hard-working Bramptonians that can't take a day off or find a hospital bed when they need one? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member very much for the question. You're absolutely right. We're certainly aware that Peel, particularly Brampton, is going through a very difficult time right now with increases in COVID-19 cases. But we are supplying uh, additional help in many areas. First of all, we have established three new community-based testing centres uh, that have, were established by November 10th. We also have implemented mobile testing sites to respond to particular needs in particular communities. And we also have limited walk-in in availability at some of the assessment centers because we know for some people there are language barriers and other issues that present themselves that make it difficult for people to phone ahead to get an appointment. So we want to make testing as easy as possible, but we also have implemented up to seven pharmacies or specimen collection centers as well, and we're working on that. And we also have provided over 70 additional case and contact managers into Peel to assist with the follow-up to make sure that we can follow up with those cases that have been identified, and we have 10 public health units. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And with all due respect to the Minister, the Premier continues to make these empty promises at press conferences, but folks in Brampton have yet to actually see those real investments flowing into our city. Health officials, community members, regional council, the mayor, everyone has been clear. Brampton needs its fair share. Brampton only has 0.96 beds per thousand residents. The provincial average, as you know, Minister, is well above 2.19 beds per resident. Our chronically underfunded health care system is putting our community at risk. When is the Premier going to address these health care inequities and ensure that our growing community receives the supports we desperately need? Thank you. Mr. Delph. Well, in fact, investments have been made in Peel Region throughout this pandemic, and I can also advise that we are investing $42 million for up to 234 new beds at three hospitals, including alternate health facilities in Peel Region, to support hospital capacity pressures and the continuation of surgeries and procedures. Now, we are also aware that their case has been made for Peel to uh, need a 24-hour new emergency department. We provided a one-time planning grant of $500,000 to support early capital planning for the Peel Memorial Centre Phase Two project, and we are reviewing all additional options, including the request for 24-7 emergency funding. That is something that's working through the Health Department right now. Uh, we would all like to say that this can happen tomorrow, but the Spons. reality is it can. It takes a long time to develop a new hospital plan. It has to be done properly to properly serve the constituents of your riding. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. In Ottawa, where my riding is located, there are 12,000 people in many families who don't have access to housing. It's more like 12,500. 
This is an increase of 15 percent since 2017. Someone in Ottawa has to earn at least $26 an hour if they want to have a two-room apartment and they have to spend 30 percent of their income. Unlike uh, municipal elections, the housing crisis aggravated by the pandemic is a real problem that requires a, an intervention. Unfortunately, there is no funding in the budget for the construction of affordable housing. My question, what is the government going to do to support the construction of affordable housing, which Ontarians need so urgently in Ottawa Vanier? Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much to the member from Ottawa Venue for her question. To respond to the pandemic, our government has invested $510 million in municipalities to build new affordable housing. It's been clear, Speaker, throughout the pandemic, we've provided uh, municipalities with $510 million uh, to be extremely flexible and create those long-term affordable housing opportunities that our communities need now more than ever. We're accelerating our supportive housing consultation. Uh, right now in Ontario, we have uh, about 20 uh, supportive housing projects, uh, 20, housing, 20 supportive housing programs within three Response. ministries. It's very confusing to navigate. We need to collaborate with our municipal partners. We also need to collaborate with the federal government. We are working with them, and we are providing additional dollars. Supplementary question. Merci. Thank you for the uh, French part of your answer. For the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Earlier this fall, the federal government, through the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, launched a $1 billion rapid housing initiative to help address the urgent housing needs of vulnerable Canadians. Provincial governments are eligible to apply for this funding, and the application deadline is December 31st of this year, 2020. Can the minister reassure this House that he is taking the necessary steps to ensure that Ontarians benefit from this available federal important funding so that we can put shovels in the ground and begin to address the urgent affordable housing needs in the province? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, merci beaucoup pour la question. Thank you very much for the question. After years of inaction in housing, our government has started to revitalize the housing sector. I assure the member opposite that we are working collaboratively with the federal government. In fact, uh, I had a fantastic conversation this morning at 8.30 with uh, my federal counterpart, uh, the Honourable Ahmed Hussein. We spoke about the program uh, that, she, uh, uh, that the member opposite uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the Rapid Housing Initiative. We're actually hoping that with the $510 million we're providing municipalities uh, and the Rapid Housing um, program at the federal level that we can actually cooperate with our municipal partners to actually do what we all want. We all want safe, affordable housing built for our less Response. vulnerable uh, by the end of next year. Uh, I've also offered the minister that if we have a municipality that wants to build something faster, I'd be more than happy to provide a minister zoning order to move that project forward. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning. Everyone, Speaker, as you know, we're well into the second wave of this COVID-19 epidemic. The first time around, migrant workers down in my area were the hardest hit. The government's response at that time was to allow them to keep working if they were infected and asymptomatic. Hundreds were contagious. Three migrant workers died in Ontario, Speaker. What is the government's plan today to get ahead and stay ahead of this next wave when it comes to the men and women from other countries working in our fields and greenhouses. Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's obviously a very good question. It's something that we work uh, in cooperation with the federal government uh, on. Uh, he is quite right. Uh, there was uh, certainly a problem uh, uh, last year. We've learned a lot from, uh, from, uh, the, first, uh, uh, from the first wave. Uh, a lot of lessons learned that we will work cooperatively with the federal government to ensure that as the, uh, the next planting season comes, 
uh, that we will have uh, addressed many of these concerns. But the member is quite right. This is an important community for us. They do so much work in our agricultural sector, and uh, we could not be as, su as successful as we are uh, without their, uh, their assistance. Thank you. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The spike in cases down my way last week identified nearly 50 new COVID cases in the agri-food sector. We had another three cases yesterday in Essex County. Municipal leaders say provincial leadership was missing in action for most of the last, the first wave of this COVID crisis. Will the government commit today to invest in the resources needed to make sure migrant farm workers in Ontario have adequate sick pay and accommodations, and that farmers have the support they need to ensure the safety of our local food supply? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Burlington. Thank you so much for uh, the question. We're committed to health and safety of all workers in this province, including temporary foreign workers. Ministry inspectors conducted 740 field visits at farms and issued 236 orders to ensure employees keep workers safe. Health and safety laws apply to all workers in Ontario. A worker's passport does not determine how they are treated. This is not the Ontario way. All employees have a duty to protect the health and safety of their workers. Workers do not have to choose between their job and their health. Well, okay. Your Speaker, my question is for the Premier. For the last few months now, we've been hearing an alarm every day of the second wave. The Premier, his Cabinet and public health continue to spread a relentless message of grave danger that COVID is about to collapse our hospitals and our health care systems and that we are in imminent peril. However, the Toronto Sun reported today that the total number of COVID patients across the entire university health network with over 1,200 hospital beds, including the Toronto General, Toronto Western, Princess Margaret and others. Speaker, can the Premier inform this House how many people are presently in these five Toronto hospitals with COVID and how many are in the ICU? Well, I can certainly advise the member opposite that uh, you, you probably heard the modeling that was presented last week that indicates that we may be up to 6,500 cases per day in Ontario by mid-December if we don't take any action. That's why we did set up the framework that we set up uh, to uh, be able to move public health regions from one zone to another with additional restrictions, because if we don't take any action, we will be in the same situation as countries like Italy and Spain and other areas where their hospitals are overwhelmed. Right now, our hospitals are operating, most of them, at about 100 per cent capacity, including some cases even a little bit more than that. But we know that hospitalization is a lagging indicator. So that as, as the number of cases climb, we're going to see the number of hospitalizations climb as well. So we need to do whatever we can to the keep response? those levels under control, even as we're adding extra beds in the process. A supplementary question. Again, to the Premier, um, I believe the Deputy Premier is preoccupied with the projections and the models. In the Toronto Sun today, the facts are that there's less than 10 in ICU with COVID. Um, and I make this distinction with, but not necessarily from COVID. Well, the Premier threatens ever more business closures and restrictions. In Hamilton, St. Joe's Hospital today, with over 1,200 beds, is reporting two people with COVID. Speaker, it appears the Premier may be slightly overstating or relying on only models that have proven to be false, uh, to, because the facts don't reconcile with the message. How can we consider the total closure of major cities like Hamilton due to two patients in their Question. largest hospitals? Speaker, my, uh, my constituents are asking me, with the Premier's relentless message of alarm, is there proof or is it just... Thank you. Minister of Health to reply. Yes, Speaker. In addition to the modelling that was presented, I can assure the member opposite that we are speaking to people on the ground each and every day within our hospital situation, in individual hospitals and within the Ontario Hospital Association. 
Yesterday, I read this, but I think Order. it's particularly relevant again today, from the Ontario, Hospitalization, Ontario Hospital Association with respect to the changes that we made to our framework. The OHA thanks the provincial government for listening for to for the Lanark, concerns Front, of Kingston, the hospital come to sector and its system partners and for its leadership in responding rapidly to the alarming COVID-19 modelling data presented yesterday. Those are the facts. Here, here. Next question, Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. As cases rise once again, for-profit long-term care facilities are once again failing the people of Ontario. Data shows that in homes experiencing an outbreak, for-profit homes have seen nearly 10 times the number of fatal cases per bed than not-for-profit homes. But still, this government is refusing to crack down. And yesterday, with the passing of Bill 218, they made it harder for families to hold LTC facilities to account. Speaker, a chief investment officer for Chartwell, a for-profit LTC chaired by former Premier Mike Harris, suggested that lawsuits from the loss of human life were, and listen carefully, frivolous, and assured shareholders that the legislation would mitigate the risk and make the threshold for proving damages very high. Why is the government trying to protect the profits of private LTCs instead of standing with the Ontarians who lost their loved ones during a pandemic? To respond, the parliamentary assistant member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Let me be absolutely clear. Individuals and organizations that ignore public health guidance and act with gross negligence or intentional misconduct will not be protected by this legislation. The narrow targeted civil liability protection in this legislation has only to do with the inadvertent transmission of COVID-19 and nothing else. This legislation does not protect any other type of negligence that we heard from the opposition previously or at committee. Like if a resident is not given proper medication or if a long-term care provider fails to provide the necessities of life, or if a long-term care provider fails to communicate adequately Spons. with families, Ontarians will continue to be able to file claims and seek justice in the court for all of these matters, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the member. The, the... <laughs> They, they said it mitigates the risk. They're no longer worried because of that legislation. So no matter what the member opposite is claiming, the people at these companies are very, very pleased with that legislation, Speaker. They are very happy that they won't be on the hook for what they did. But now to my question. Since the beginning of this, it's about families who have lost loved ones. Families such as Terry Daniels, who lives in my riding, whose father tragically passed, passed away. And I, I have heard an absence of comments or compassion from the members opposite for those who have lost their loved ones during this pandemic. On Twitter and in the press, several reporters, including Mike Crawley, have criticized the Minister of Health for updates for not having death tolls included in them. And so I decided to go back and look and see when the last time the minister had that Question. In, her, in her daily updates. I couldn't find any tweets before from before the 6th of June, Speaker. I'm wondering where these tweets have gone and when will the minister actually begin giving us these numbers again? <laughs> to reply, Minister Tuff. In fact, this information is readily available to all Ontarians on the daily updates that they can see on our coronavirus site. With respect to tweets, I think it's important to be respectful to the uh, many families who have lost family members. This isn't something that one should be tweeting about. This is very serious. It's very tragic for these families. However, the information is available in another location. Thank you. There will be no further business this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.